future. Um, and again, the part is a robust quantum control. And I, I hope that it will be interesting to people. I'm probably be throwing out some kind of new idea. It's actually been really exciting to be here. I haven't traveled much since before the pandemic. So it's nice to see people. I haven't seen them a long time again. And also to see that some of the crazy ideas like the Apple of Crystal Brawl and flying basically with stuff that they discussed maybe in 2005, 6, 7, 8. Actually, people have done some real applications. People have had things to do with it. And, and kind of this is the spirit basically. I hope. Yeah, like this will kind of inspire you to think about things, uh, basically. So I'd like to thank the organizers, and I hope it will be kind of it will make sense. Now, before I started the scientific content, I've been dragged into sort of doing some uh, work for a new journal one of my colleagues, basically, made, like I came up with this research direction for quantum technology published by Ken. You are or you can just like Google it. Basically, and I just want to mention briefly because one thing, one reason why I got involved with this is that research direction aims to be different from traditional journals. And really, what we wanted to do is capture all the kind of stuff that often gets lost. So the idea is basically that uh, the journal is is uh, formulated around research questions, and anybody can submit a research question. The first set of questions were submitted by the editors. And then the idea is we, what we're hoping is people would submit maybe reviews, results, analysis papers, incremental pieces of work. And in particular, we'd like to capture data sets, code, presentations, the kind of stuff that contains lots of useful information, but often kind of just gets lost. And then maybe eventually there'll be some impact papers summarizing the results. It's fully open access. There are publication charges, but for most people, it would be covered by institutional agreements with Cambridge University Press. And I've been uh, told if you don't have money to pay, that will not be a restriction. So that was an absolute condition that nobody would be prevented from publishing. So I thought it might be an opportunity, like especially there were so many good posters and stuff. So if anybody's interested, you know, if you have code, data sets, poster stuff that you'd like to publish, this could be an opportunity. I just wanted to, to, to basically mention it. Email me, maybe we could somehow, you know, publish some of this uh, basically. And especially code, it's very, very low, like profile and, 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 and stuff. It's not like you have to upload and test all your code and stuff. If it's already on GitHub, you could probably do this in a few minutes. You get a DOI. It's, you can then easily cite it, and all the citations will be counted by Google Scholar and stuff. So that would be another benefit. So if you already got the code, you might as well kind of publish it. So I just wanted to mention it because I thought this would be an opportunity to capture these outputs that are often, they kind of get lost. And this is really where all the meat is, right? Uh, so anyway. Uh, I'll shut up now and, and uh, about this and actually talk about some science. And as I said, this is collaborative work with my long-term collaborator. And I don't know which one is which. Ah, here we go. Uh, Edmund Juncker and Frank, and then the two PhD students. Now, Sean is actually, he's been in the army for more than 20 years. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but he's really keen to get out. So if you have a job for him, basically he's just finishing his PhD and I think he's very keen to get out of the army. So he probably hates me for using this picture, but I think it kind of makes us look really professional. And that's a task that we've just finished and then Kerry who's here. So anyway, I'll, I'll try to uh, actually start talking about some science. So an overview of my talk, I'll start a, a little bit with what is robust control and why is it important? Why should you give a shit? Because there are many different notions of robust control and everybody has their own idea. And what I want to do here is basically part of my collaboration with classical control people like Edmund, we have discussions. I want to review a little bit of classical robust control and the kind of techniques that are out there. And then I want to explain also why I think we need different tools for quantum systems, not because we hate classical control and we just don't want to look at it, but there are some real limitations. And then I want to talk about quantifying robustness for quantum systems. Uh, I will start with a kind of singular value or mu analysis, uh, which is kind of very popular in modern robust control, and then log sensitivity and differential sensitivity, and I think this is where it will link up really nicely to the previous talk. Uh, that's uh, basically, and then I'll talk a little bit about robustness, infidelity measures, statistical measures, and um, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, and then there will be conclusions and future work. Okay, 
So that's basically the overview. So first of all, what is robust control? If you ask 10 people what robust control is, you might get 10 different answers. But in control theory, there are actually sort of accepted definitions. But broadly, it's about designing control systems that are able to function properly in the presence of all manner of uncertainties and variation in the system and environment. Now, these uncertainties, there can be lots of different things from external disturbances to noise from measurement, actuators, variations in the system parameters themselves. There's, it's really very broad. And in my opinion, robustness or robust control and design is absolutely critical if you want to take a physics experiment out of the lab, basically, and turn it into technology. So I think uh, that's going to be make or break. Can we actually create quantum technology or are we just playing, uh, you know, with, with our toy systems? And I think it's absolutely uh, critical for all kinds of technology, especially and including quantum systems. Now, basically, again, how do you measure robustness? You ask 10 different people in the room and you probably get 10 different answers. Now, there are some measures that basically are used in classical control. Uh, one of these sort of more traditional, old-fashioned measures would be the differential and log sensitivity. The pros are it's very broadly applicable. You can literally throw it at, every, at anything. There are no stability requirements, but the problem is it's generally, it's generally limited to small perturbations. Then in control theory, you also have gain and phase margins, which more or less tell you how much a system's gain or phase can be increased before it becomes unstable. And here you can see these notions of robustness are completely predicated on the notion of stability. And the pros of, of, of this kind of stuff is, again, it's really simple. You can prove analytical results, which people absolutely love. The, the cons, you can see, especially you will, you will see in a minute why stability is such a critical issue. This only works if you have stability, and so it has limited applicability for quantum systems. And then there's statistical techniques that are often based on Monte Carlo simulations. The pros, you can deal with all sorts of unstructured, structured perturbations, even large ones. The cons, computationally, is very demanding, and there's no, usually it's very difficult to come up with any analytical results or performance guarantees if you just have Monte Carlo simulations. And so enter modern robust control. So modern robust control, basically, the goal is to ensure that a control system remains stable and provides satisfactory performance in the presence of uncertainty. And I have underlined satisfactory performance and stability. So basically, you want to design controllers that are less sensitive to changes in the system and environment and can adapt to disturbance. And that, I think, in, in, in principle, right, that is also what we want to do with our quantum system. But let me first tell you a little bit about the approaches in modern robust control. So there are two popular approaches. One is H infinity control, which, if I had to summarize this in a sentence, mostly it was uh, the, the goal is to optimize the worst case performance of a system uh, when you have a range of unstructured perturbations or uncertainty. And then there is new analysis, which is a little bit newer, which basically uh, has a similar goal, optimize the controller to achieve a desired level of performance while simultaneously guaranteeing robust stability when you have structured uncertainty. And I will talk about this. And most of the uncertainties we have been talking about are often structured. We have an idea what the structure of the perturbation is. But if you want universal robustness, then uh, typically uh, you might have unstructured uncertainties. I'll, I'll try and explain this a little bit better. Now, um, I need to say a little bit, I need to talk a little bit about LTI systems because most of modern robust control revolves around LTI systems, that's linear time invariant system. And first, when I looked at this, I was like, ah, linear time invariant systems, there's no applicability at all to quantum systems. So in case you don't know, a linear time invariant system is simply a linear dynamical system. Um, you have a state variable. Oh, I did it in stupid order. X is a state vector that basically, so you have a linear differential equation for the state. U is a control, and you have some observable quantities that are measured by sensors, uh, which I call Y, and I, I call them observable. What's nice about this, these linear dynamical systems, you can transform these differential equations into a system of algebraic equations by taking the Laplace transform, which control theorists love. And now you can see. Once you've got the Laplace transform here, you can actually, you just have algebraic equations, you can even eliminate the state, and then you can basically 
models the system entirely by a transfer function, which is an input output map from the control to the observable. It's algebraic. It's like you can do you can do math with it, right? And you can generalize it to noisy closed loop systems with many channels of noise and what have you, and state feedback. And then uh, you know you can write down the information. Uh, version lemma, there's all kinds of uh, like uh, algebraic tools that you can write down these transfer functions for very, very complex things. So that's a kind of cost. Now, when I first looked at it, I was like, ah, oh, this isn't going to be very useful for quantum systems because we basically never deal with linear time invariant systems, right? But you'll see in a minute, it's actually not as bad. Now, I don't know how much you want me to, to say about age infinity control. As I said, it's mainly it aims to, ma to minimize the worst case sensitivity of a system uh, to unstructured uncertainties and perturbations. And unstructured would be probably universal robust control. It could be anything. And basically, when they talk about minimization, oh, the wrong button. OK, maybe I'll figure it out. Basically, when, when you talk about minimization uh, in the modern control context, it is usually minimizing the L infinity norm of the transfer function, subject to stability constraints, approach you can handle a wide range of unstructured uncertainties, unmodeled dynamics, external disturbances, or clowns that, like even in a classical or conventional control context, it's not always easy to tune the cost function. They have the exact same problems we have and solve the resulting optimization. Uh, problems when you want simultaneous performance and stability uh, uh, basically satisfy stability requirements it can be computationally challenging but that's not why we should why it's not a good idea for or why it's not sufficient for quantum systems structure singular value analysis is kind of similar again i don't want to go through it through it in too much detail because otherwise i'll never finish with the class and i know this is the last talk in the session and you want to probably have lunch and go home or what have you so I'm going to try not to get sidetracked too much. So structure singular values or mu analysis is the second sort of tool in the modern control toolbox that is really popular. And Edmund, my collaborator, really loves this stuff. And the, the main reason people really love it is, is because it gives you a basically performance guarantees. So basically, once you go and have that structured singular value, you can say if this the magnitude of the, uh, of the disturbance is less than one over mu, it guarantees you that the normal of the transfer function is less than mu. So you basically have uh, you have performance guarantees. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, again, I haven't really explained the notation completely, and that's the sort of thing I would like to have for quantum systems. Like I would like to say, if I have certain structured perturbations, as long as the magnitude of the perturbation is less than than this, then uh, the magnitude of the error. And here, this transfer function, this is just a notation, uh, basically. This is a transfer function from the disturbance to the error. And Edwin insists that I use W and then the C, basically, because this is kind of what's often used in the field. So, so this is why. But basically, this it, it tells you when the disturbance is less than a certain magnitude, then uh, the error will be less than a certain magnitude, if you want. Again, uh, the pros, this can deal with structured uncertainties, parametric uncertainties, unmodeled dynamics. Uh, it can deal with loads of different things and it gives you more detailed information about controllers and what you can achieve with infinity control. Again, it's computationally challenging, difficult optimization problems, all of that. Uh, basically, just to give you a very, very sort of rough overview. So I would say age infinity control and new analysis are probably two of the tools that modern in modern robust control uh, you know, kind of consider it, you know, important and that's what people use. Now, why? Now, I think the notions and the ideas of performance guarantees and stuff, these are extremely relevant uh, to quantum systems. But we'll see in a minute why there are problems applying this formula. And uh, you, you've seen that both uh, basically mu analysis and age infinity control they are fundamentally predicated on this notion of stability. It's a fundamental property. And you can kind of see when you talk to classical control people, they say, well, stability is absolutely non-negotiable. How can you have robust performance of a system without stability? It's important for safe and predictable operation. You can, you can easily see that instability tends to lead to unpredictable behavior. There could be like uh, oscillations, uh, 
you know, the system failure. For instance, think of an aircraft. It may experience, if it experiences uncontrollable roll and yaw or uh, pitch oscillations, it can easily lead uh, to loss of control with catastrophic consequences. The plane crashes and everybody dies, right? So you don't kind of want that. Or if you had an unstable chemical process, you can have runaway chemical reactions that lead to explosions causing serious harm to people in the environment. So basically control theories will usually say that kind of stability like the system should be fundamentally stable. It's a sort of prerequisite for robust performance. Now, why is this a problem? Now, before I get, get to this, I want to introduce some notions of stability, but I think I'm just going to talk about the first one because for this talk, that's all we need. What are the criteria for stability for linear time invariant systems? There's multiple. The most basic is a pole zero uh, condition that basically says an LPI system is stable if and only if all poles of its transfer function lie in the open left half plane of, of open left half plane of the complex plane. So that means the real part of all the poles are negative. That just remember negative real part poles in the left half of the plane. There's a couple of other conditions, but we can skip over these in the interest of time because we'll only need the first one. So can we apply this to quantum systems? That's uh, basically, you know, can we apply it? Well, one problem is just looking at this, you know, my, my five minute introduction is basically modern robust control. It's mostly a framework for, for control of linear time invariant system with an emphasis on stability. And I said, when you talk to engineers, you can see why linear linearity is good, nonlinear systems, is, you know, they're prone to instability. Stability and linearity are good things. The problem is, when you look at quantum dynamics, well, quantum dynamics is typically modeled by the Schrodinger quantum Liouville equation. So to start with, you have a complex nonlinear equation, and usually it's a control of the now time invariant either. Now, the first part, the fact that it is a complex equation really isn't a big deal, because we can very easily reformulate the, the dynamics in terms of real equations. We simply choose a basis for the Lie algebra, that may be the Hermitian matrices or any kind of sub-algebra. And by choosing a basis for the Lie algebra, we can expand basically the state. Let's let me just go through this. We can expand the state and all the system, the dynamical operators with regard to this Lie, Lie algebra basis, and then we get basically a dynamic equation for the state vector x, which is now a real vector, and all the other matrices, the dynamical matrices, are also real. So we can easily make it real. So the fact that we have complex uh, like operators is not really a problem. We can turn this into a real uh, equation. And you can see here, I think by AS, this is a system contribution. E is the environment contribution. C is a controller contribution. You can, you, you can change the notation. So I tend to call these block matrices, but you can call them anything you like, basically. So the fact that we have complex dynamics is not a problem. Now, the linearity or lack of linearity still is a problem. And the second thing I would like you to take away from this is any bilinear system can be transformed into a linear system through full state feedback. And I think that idea was probably first discussed at a 2014 workshop at the Newton Institute where Robert Kosud kind of uh, talked about uh, that there's some hidden feedback in uh, when you have bilinear equations, you have the hidden feedback. And it's actually very, very easy to make it formal. If you, ha if you start with a bilinear system, all you need to do is basically introduce a full state feedback, and you can basically transform the bilinear system into a system that looks like a linear system. It's not necessarily time invariant if these control operators depend on time-dependent control, but any bilinear system you could basically transform into a linear system using full state feedback, and then you can define a transfer function and do all sorts of good things. So anytime you have a bilinear system, you actually have hidden feedback. And I think that's why quantum control is actually, even in the open loop, loop context, it has a built-in robust. I think it's because you can always just rewrite it. You could basically interpret it as a linear system with full state feedback. Now, Edmund likes to call this fictitious feedback. I don't think it's fictitious. It's just, it's a mathematical formulation, but it's, it's, a, it's real feedback in the sense that it, you don't have to make any measurements, but it is a real feedback, uh, basically. But we can argue about the terminology. 
Now, time invariance is still an issue because if you want time invariance, basically, then you need that control uh, operator to be time invariant. And that control operator will depend on basically the Hamiltonian. So this is the block representation of the Hamiltonians and the controls. And of course, if the controls are not time invariant, if they're time dependent controls, then it is going to be a linear system with state feedback, uh, but it's not going to be autonomous or time invariant. Um, so that is a problem. The time invariance can be a problem. Now, at this point, I want to point out, so the fact that it's complex was not a problem. The fact that we have a bilinear system isn't really a problem either. The time invariance can be a problem, but I think it's not absolutely critical either. I think we can deal with the time invariance. But one problem we have immediately, we can see stability is a problem. Because when you look at this transfer function, like if you're good with transfer function, you can immediately see that this LTI system has this transfer function. Uh, basically, when you do the Laplace cancel, if you're not used to this, then you'll just have to believe me. But if you believe this, uh, me that this is a transfer function from the control to the observable output, you can see immediately the pole of this transfer functions are equivalent to the eigenvalues of this matrix A. And that matrix A is comprised of system control and environment. The system, uh, if the system is Hamiltonian, then that block matrix A is anti-symmetric. If the control is coherent, then the control matrix is anti-symmetric. So the only part that might not be anti-symmetric and generally isn't is the environmental dynamics A. Now, why is this important? Because if you have no environment, I think this is on my next slide. If you have a closed system with no environment, it means the block matrix, no matter what Lie algebra representation you choose, is always going to be anti-symmetric. And if you look at the eigenvalues, they're always going to be purely imaginary. So all the poles lie on the imaginary axis, not in the open left path plane. And the control in control theory, it's just considered marginally stable. Marginally stable systems are a bit. Uh, so uh, now, it, but it gets worse. As soon as you add an environment, you can see that the environment actually pushes the system from the marginal stability into the realm of stability. Basically, uh, you will get, you, you have negative, basically, as soon as you add an environment, typically the block matrix, the eigenvalues have negative real part. And now this is what I call the curse of stability that when you add an environment, it acts as a stabilizing controller for the coherent quantum dynamic. So I think that makes it a lot worse than classical noise, because in a classical situation, you usually design a stabilizing controller, and the noise kind of you know, adds instability, destabilizes the system, and your point of your controller is to just bring it back to the stable, you know, make sure that it remains stable. But here you have a system that is marginally stable, the control system is marginally stable, but your environment stabilizes it. Now you might say, fantastic, you get a free stabilizing controller, but what, what's not to like? Well, the problem is that the state that, are sta that the environment acts as a stabilizing controller, but the problem is that the stabilized state, okay, I still can't use the controls. <laughs> so I do control, but I obviously can't use the controls here. That, that's just too simple, I guess. So the problem is the stabilized state and the dynamics in most cases are classic. And I think that's why decoherence is such a bitch, that decoherence isn't just like classical noise. It acts as a stabilizing controller for a marginally stable system, and, that make, uh, and, it, and it stabilizes mostly classical states. And now you can see if we optimize our stability margin, as modern control would have us do, uh, basically we're just maximizing the rate of entanglement loss. And basically we're just, we are optimizing the rate at which the system approaches classicality in most cases. And so we lose our quantum advantage. So we cannot just throw, well, we can do this. It's just not very useful. We'll just end up with a classical system. But there are exceptions. So, so I hope I have convinced you now that the, non, that the fact that we have complex dynamics and it's nonlinear is not really the problem. The time invariance is a bit more dicey. The stability is an issue. So the first question is, what do you mean by robust performance without stabilization? If you talk to classical engineers, some people would say it's rob that robust performance without stability just doesn't make any sense because a marginally stable system is never going to be robust. 
Now that's going to be a problem. If that's the answer, then you're done, right? Robust quantum control, just forget about it. It's never going to be robust if you require stability. So I think you could probably have some notion of robust performance, but uh, the question is, what should it be? What would qualify as robust performance for quantum systems? You have to consider the margin of stability and the non-LTI system. And then, uh, like, of course, if you say, like, that's directly related to the next question. How can we measure robust performance? Any measure of robust performance that's predicated on stability margin is going to be a problem, right? Because in most cases, if you say you need a stability margin, then basically your system is or you're, you're, you're already done or you know, like it's just you 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 won't have much of a quantum advantage. Or although I will uh, point out some exceptions. So quantification of robust performance involves assessing the system of the ability to cope with a wide variety, wide range of uncertainties and disturbances, which is challenging. And basically, so we have some measures basically. And, and the previous talk was a fantastic example. So we can sort of you know look at. We, 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 we have certain measures. The question is, everybody has a sort of their own measure. So I think one thing is we really need to understand what do we really mean by robust performance? What measures can we use that are kind of universal? And another challenge we have uh, in classical control, typically your performance metric, you want these to be linear functions of the state. Again, nonlinearities are bad, but sometimes for quantum systems, we really want nonlinear. Uh, like uh, functions, for instance, entanglement measures, concurrent. These are nonlinear functions, and that causes some additional headaches. Now, I don't think this is going to be the big challenge, but it does cause some headaches, basically. Now, before I go on, basically discussing, you know, all these maybe new notions uh, of robustness for quantum control, I want to point out one exception: reservoir engineering. There is a class of quantum control problems that we can often formulate as LTI systems that do meet stability criteria. And that's a lot of reservoir engineering problems. And I'll just very briefly show you one example. I think this is based on a system like that. So some work I did with Felix and Birgitta uh, years ago, basically with two qubits in a lossy cavity or two qubits in separate cavities connected by some fiber. And the idea was to, do, to uh, design the system so that you would generate a, uh, entanglement. And now let's see if I can find the button. And I mean, the simplest version of the dynamics is basically given by this uh, Liouville equation, which is Hamiltonian. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go through the details, basically, because you can find all the details in this paper. Um, the idea is you can show that this system has a globally asymptotically uh, stable steady state and it kind of converges to the steady state and there's entanglement and, and, and so forth. And what we did in, in some recent work, we actually analyzed the robustness of this system uh, with regard to structured perturbation. So we formulated certain perturbations for the system that we kind of maybe commonly encounter effective qubit ca cavity coupling, detuning of individual qubits, collective decay, single qubit decay. Those were the most obvious things. We wrote these down in terms of structured perturbations. And this was a system that did satisfy all the requirements for applying mu analysis. So um, here is just some examples. Again, I could give a whole talk talking about this and explaining all of this. I just wanted to point out, so for instance, we can then uh, calculate the error gain, basically, again, in terms of the normal for transfer function as a function of frequency, uh, basically, for different perturbations. And then you can kind of see, like, so the, 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 the error gain depends, obviously, on the frequency, and it depends on the type of perturbation. We can find the maximum error gain, and basically, then, uh, plotted versus delta, and that kind of relates also to what we've, what we've seen. Again, to really explain this, I would probably need an hour, but the point is we can do this analysis, and I think this could be useful if you wanted to do mu synthesis, for instance, to maximize your, the robustness of your entanglement stabilization, or like uh, these kind of plots could be useful if you know what the, um, um, the noise spectrum looks like. You could basically look at the noise spectrum and then you kind of look at these plots and go, ah, you know, it's very sensitive to those frequencies. Maybe I look at a different scheme where the frequencies the system is most sensitive to are not 
you know, like the noise spectrum maybe is, is, is I don't know, have a, I, I don't know, you know what I mean. If you know the noise spectrum, you could try to engineer, the, you could try to, to improve the robustness by moving the spikes, basically, where the system is very sensitive, maybe to a regime where the, the noise spectrum is, is, is less. I don't know if that makes sense. But you get the idea. We also looked at, uh, basically, we looked at the concurrence here. And here you can see the concurrence and another measure of, in, of robustness, the log sensitivity. And here's the maximum real part of the eigenvalues. And one thing I just wanted to point out, as a concurrence is to one, you can see the log sensitivity kind of goes off. And that's a common situation. So basically, it means as you approach unit uh, concurrent maximum performance, uh, basically, you can see your logarithmic sensitivity of the concurrent uh, basically diverges. And I will show uh, later on that this is like a common setting. So, so basically, what this would say is that this system is robust to a certain extent. But it isn't so robust with regard to the logarithmic sensitivity, although you can see it drops off very, very sharply and eventually kind of levels out. Again, I could talk about this system uh, in great detail. And, 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 and basically, I just wanted to point out that I think reservoir engineering problem might be amenable to this framework, basically. And there's mu synthesis. You could then try to optimize your reservoir engineering scheme to be more robust with regard to the perturbations uh, take, and taking the noise spectrum of your actual system into account. I don't know if that makes sense. I, I said I could talk the entire hour just about this example, but I want to go beyond reservoir engineering because most of the people in the room do not spend their time on reservoir engineering, right? Although it, I think it is a useful thing. Beyond reservoir engineering, things get a lot more dicey because a lot of the notions, basically, of stability and the design, uh, basically, in modern robust control, they're just not really suitable for what we want, as I explained earlier. Now, one notion that is applicable is the differential and logarithmic sensitivity. So if we take an LTI system and you have an unstructured uh, or an uncertainty that is structured by some structure matrix S, so again, that, that's basically, that could be a Hamiltonian Lindblad operator, whatever. So you have a structure that tells you the kind of structure of the perturbation and the magnitude, and then a nominal value. So basically, I know you will probably say, ah, you can't keep your notation straight. We've changed it a few times. So here I adopted this notation, and I can already see a misprint. So basically, here you had your um, unperturbed dynamics, and then you have the perturbation, which it has structure S, and then I, I here I change it so it's delta minus delta zero, but delta zero is a nominal value of the parameter, and then it should say for sufficiently small delta minus delta zero. So, so we change the notation a few times. Basically, we can quantify the effect of this uncertainty here on a performance measure, which I denoted by Y tilde, because Edmund wants, it, wants me to call it this, because this is, I guess, what some control engineers use. Y tilde is just basically, it could be an observable that you measure. It could be the state fidelity. It could be the gauge fidelity. It could be your concurrence, although concurrence be a bit dicey because it's a nonlinear measure. But basically, Y tilde is just your uh, performance measure. And uh, so the differential sensitivity, like, basically, is very simple. You ju it's just the derivative of your performance measure with regard to the, with regard to delta evaluated at the nominal delta, value delta zero, typically. So that would be sort of the instantaneous value. And the logarithmic sensitivity is derived from the differential sensitivity, but it is scaled. You basically divide by y tilde over delta zero, and then you can rewrite it this way. Now, um, the advantage of using the log sensitivity is you can see that the differential sensitivity is not dimensional as it has units. So if you want to combine different differential sensitivities, if, say, with regard to the detuning and decoherence, and I don't know, the coupling strength, this is not so convenient. So initially, we thought this isn't a good notion. The log sensitivity is dimensionless. So we thought, yeah, let's use the log sensitivity. And initially, we didn't really, it's kind of like absolute and, and relative uncertainty. But there are some, some issues you can see with this definition of the log sensitivity. It's a nominal value of your per, 
for, for a perturbation is zero. Like if you have a, a system with no decoherence and you want to study the effect of decoherence, if the nominal value is zero, then that logarithmic sensitivity by definition. But when you define it like this, it would be zero, <clears throat> which is why in some papers where we studied decoherence as a perturbation, we modified the definition of the log sensitivity slightly. So I apologize for all these different definitions. It's just when we started, we didn't know exactly which version we should use. So different papers use slightly different versions. So the advantage of using the differential and log sensitivity is analytically uh, tractable. We can derive analytical solutions uh, or expressions at least, um, especially if the performance measure is linear in the state. And we can apply it to both frequency domain control problems, which are control series love, and time domain control problems. We can potentially extend this for nonlinear performance measures as well, and we can do it, we can extend it to time varying systems as well. Again, the time varying systems are not completely non-trivial, but in but but this is a very sort of general notion. And I think, for instance, this measure would apply, for instance, uh, you, you could use a logarithmic sensitivity like the previous talk when you have different perturbation. You could use that as a sort of independent measure. I think that would that would be applicable. Now, the limitations, the challenges is that uh, it mostly provides a local measure of sensitivity or robustness. That, to me, is a big, uh, like, a limitation. And, it, and on its own, it doesn't give you any bounds on the maximum allowable perturbations uh, or performance bounds, like the, the mu value does, where you say if the perturbation is less than a certain magnitude, then you're guaranteed that the error will be less than a certain value. Um, it currently it is limited uh, to basically just analyzing the robustness of existing controllers, but potentially you could try to incorporate these notions into the control synthesis uh, and, and see if you can, by doing so, you can improve the robustness. Now, let me just very quickly give you some flavor of what we have done with this, and then I hope that you guys come up with better applications. So we started out with application uh, basically Basically, development of the time domain log sensitivity. This is this um, transactions of automatic control paper. So one application on, in the quantum realm, we looked at entanglement generation by reservoir engineering. That problem that you've previously seen. So we just, you know, we just like to recycle and use the same problem. And you can see here you have the log sensitivity uh, basically on this axis so in blue. And you have the fidelity error uh, basically in, I don't know, red or something. And you can see as the fidelity error asymptotically goes to zero, this, remember this was an asymptotic stabilization scheme, the log sensitivity uh, in this case diverges. And you can analytically show that it polynomially diverges in all cases. In most cases, the polynomial divergence is linear. But unfortunately, we get the polynomial divergence uh, for, these, for this scheme. And for the uh, another problem we looked at was perfect state transfer. Does everyone remember in the early 2000s, spin to perfect state transfer, engineered spin chains with perfect state transfer? There was a lot of excitement about this at some point, maybe 20 something years ago. So we looked at these spin chains with engineered couplings where we have an analytic solution. And unfortunately, it's the same thing. So the, um, the fidelity error. Basically, I think we plot it the logarithm of the error is red and log sensitivity also on the log in blue. And you can see as the error basically goes to zero, the logarithm of the error goes to minus infinity, the log sensitivity again like goes up, and you can show that the log sensitivity also diverges. Anytime you hit, like for the analytical solutions, the log sensitivity will diverge when you reach perfect state transfer. So that's kind of not so good. So in that sense, we have some limitation on robustness. But it's, things are not all that bad. So we then looked at the log sensitivity for what I call energy landscape control. Basically, it just means I have static control fields that kind of define an energy landscape. Now, initially, my idea, the idea I had in my head was you had, say, electrons in quantum dots, you know, or, yeah, I think my, my initial scheme was electrons in quantum dots and the surface uh, control electrodes that create basically an, an energy landscape. And then in 2015 or so, like we had this quaint network, uh, Jacob 
she also convinced me that we should really look at apples in, in um, optical traps because we can kind of manipulate the optical landscape and this would be like really a good realization. And this is something we are currently trying to see if we can implement this kind of energy landscape control using the atoms. And this is where Kerry comes in, but I won't have time to basically talk about this. So this is, is completely abstract, but this is kind of what, what, what motivated it. So we looked at state transfer and spin chains and rings, and this is a ring example. So uh, we basically optimize these energy landscapes for the, for the system. And here, this is again the log sensitivity. And if you change the notation a little bit again, I apologize. This is just figures from different papers. And here's the log sensitivity, the log the error. And notice here, we see that uh, as the error increases, the log goes down. And here, uh, I think the red dots are Hamiltonian perturbations, and the blue dots are control perturbations. These are not actually controlled perturbations, that, but that's perturbations with the control Hamiltonian. It, that's important because the perturbations with regard to the control usually have some intrinsic robustness if you optimize because delta, the right, but if you use a gradient algorithm, the delta with respect to the derivative with respect to the control typically vanishes. So this is perturbation of the control Hamiltonian. So here you see a negative correlation, but then we actually notice some interesting stuff and we don't fully understand this, but all of the stuff is available like I think uh, the code, the data set, everything is available. So if you have a student or your board, you can absolutely download all of this and, and do a lot more analysis. So one thing, so this all makes sense still. It kind of behaves similar to what you classically expect. You typically have a negative correlation, fidelity error, and log sensitivity. But then we saw some really crazy shit happening. This was a three ring by the subject. You just lost two transfer, basically, so you want so you could think of a sort of token ring and you want to uh, move around your expectations and stuff. And here you see a crazy behavior of the log sensitivity on the, and the fidelity error, basically. Uh, so that's pretty crazy. Now, one thing that was different here is it was a kind of optimization objective. This was actually optimized. The second case was optimized for finite bandwidth readout. Again, I don't have time to explain this, so I'm not sure if that's uh, what explains the crazy behavior. We also extended this to uh, basically look at the coherence of the perturbation. And again, I'm not going to have time to explain it in much detail. I just want to kind of give you a flavor what you can apply it to. So we, we explored different ways of calculating the log sensitivity in an analytic way. Uh, basically, and uh, kernel density uh, approximation, and then we ask we, we, we ask some questions. For instance, if you look at energy landscape controllers, if you optimize them for decoherence, but we don't know exactly what the decoherence channels are. We just optimize them for average decoherence. Are they more robust uh, than uh, if you optimize with no decoherence? And in our case, we found no. The answer was no. And also, is there a trade-off that is a negative correlation between fidelity error and this uh, log sensitivity as a robustness measure? Yes, if you look at this table, basically you see um, all the different controllers and, 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 and stuff, basically. So I think I'm getting there. The last slide I have before the summary is that uh, then finally we have actually extended this from energy landscape control where you have basically static control uh, to dynamic gate control. And uh, let's see, I think in like the previous slide, basically here is a paper where we where we extended this. We generalized the differential sensitivity to keep a constant control of this attendance formula. And the important thing is we actually derived some performance guarantees similar to mu analysis in this paper. And then we applied this, again, if you want, I, I'm not gonna put it all up there, we applied this to uh, dynamic gate control. We did a little bit of research and a lot of arguing. And in the end, we decided we used the same kind of benchmark set, basically, that we used in a 2012 paper. Uh, Thomas, you'll remember that, like, two to five qubit Ising and Heisenberg change with individual controls or, uh, like, a global controls and quantum Fourier transform, C0 gate and random unitaries and all sorts of different options. And now here we looked at the differential sensitivity and I just want to point out, we see the opposite trend than for the logarithmic sensitivity. This isn't so surprising, but what I 
when when you when you think about it more. But when I was initially struck, I did not expect a positive, strong positive correlation between the differential sensitivity and the the error, because I kind of expected that there still would be a trade-off. But here, the notice across the board for all of these two to five qubits, like across the board, you see a positive correlation. And, and how is this relevant? Well, actually, I have one more thing which I won't explain. If you look at statistics, and another thing you've looked at is statistical measures based on the Wasserstein distance. The first order of Wasserstein distance turns out uh, basically it's just the average fidelity. And we also showed that the, the first order of Wasserstein distance is positively correlated with the differential sensitivity. So, uh, and the differential sensitivity is positively correlated with the error. So what does that mean? Well, what it means basically, it, it seems there is no trade-off. And in my opinion, if, if my interpretation is correct, it would seem to suggest that optimizing the average gate fidelity doesn't actually really increase robustness. Because the average gate fidelity corresponds to the first order Wasserstein distance, which is which is positively correlated with the um, then with, with the differential sensitivity, but the differential sensitivity is positively correlated with the fidelity error. So maybe all you're doing when you when you optimize the average gate fidelity is you just increase the computation overhead, but you control in terms of when you look at it in terms of the um, differential sensitivity. Basically, that linear relationship suggests suggests that something something odd is going on, and it might not actually be sensible to optimize the average gate fidelity. And I said I had a few more slides. I could explain that in more detail, but let me just summarize. I think you get the flavor. There, there's, there, there's like a lot of papers out there. If you are interested, uh, basically, like just email me, and I'll send you the the slides, or maybe we can publish these. Uh, so let me summarize. Robust uh, system and control design, in my opinion essential for technology, but modern robust control is insufficient for, to, to solve this problem for quantum systems because quantum systems generally have nonlinear input output relationships with time dependent controls, although I have shown you that this is generally not a killer. Um, uh, something that is more serious is that quantum control problems are typically time domain problems. I haven't really had time to really elaborate on that because there's only like 50 minutes. Uh, so, for instance, in, in, uh, for frequency domain control, you're often interested in the worst case performance of a range of frequencies, but for our problem, this isn't really useful. We don't really care. And again, I could explain why we don't care. So, so that's an issue. And then probably the biggest issue, though, is that for closed quantum systems subject to coherent control, we have only marginal stability, and stability often kills our quantum advantage. So maximizing stability margins is literally like, like counterproductive. Um, we also have nonlinear performance measures, so that's in terms of the differences in terms of conclusions and outlook. I do think there are some areas where age infinity control and especially mu analysis may be useful. Reservoir engineering, I think mu synthesis might be a way to redesign reservoir engineering so, uh, scheme so that we actually have performance bounds uh, and, and, and we can maximize stability margins. Um, for, be, beyond that, differential and logarithmic sensitivity, I think, might be a useful tool at least to get started. Uh, statistical measures such as the Wasserstein distance basically are useful, but I still think there's a long way to go to develop a framework for robust system and control design for quantum systems, taking into account lack of time invariance and nonlinearity, marginal stability and the fact that we mostly deal with time domain control tasks and nonlinear performance measures. And I think that more or less is what I wanted to say. And I'm sorry I talked too fast and I uh, didn't explain everything properly. Yet. But I hope I give people a bit of a flavor. And I hope you can kind of see like the previous talk. Where, where is the speaker? I'm, I'm basically blind. Right, right here. OK. I'm basically blind, basically. With my glasses on, I can see in the distance, but not <laughs> Too close. So you can kind of, I think that this notion of differential sensitivity, for instance, could be applied and it would be very interesting to look at your scheme. And for instance, if you optimize with different penalty terms, does it actually improve the differential sensitivity? So that could be something that could be done. Uh, I said, the, the, the thing that shocked me, I was kind of convinced that if you, if you took the average gate fidelity, if you optimize the average gate fidelity, it would increase robustness. 
But this kind of suggests that's kind of stupid. You just increase your computational overhead, but you might not actually gain very much. So I don't know. Maybe my interpretation here is wrong. But when I see these correlations, this is not what I expected to see. So maybe we made any mistake. Anyway. Okay. Thank you very much.